while the story of salmon in the Northwest is well known, the three species in the Colorado River Basin, it's a very similar story. These fish are the main biomass. They migrate long distances. They return to the same stream year after year for spawning. They're really an important part of the ecosystems and the natural heritage of the state. The three species are flannelmouth sucker, bluehead sucker, and round-tailed chub. And we kind of treat them as a cohesive unit in a lot of our management practices. They're endemic to the Colorado River Basin, which means they're only found in the Colorado River and its tributaries. They're pretty sleek. They're really strong swimmers. If you're dealing with them in the spring especially, they're really colorful. The flannel mouse suckers get this bright yellow and orange. The blue heads, that blue head kind of gets a little more noticeable and they'll get a nice red stripe on the side. And then my personal favorite are the round tail chubs. They get this pink and red coloration on their bellies. They're every bit as colorful as a cutthroat trout. And then just getting to see these spawning migrations they go on, it really is a natural wonder that's happening here in western Colorado, sort of right under our noses. When they undergo these migrations, they're bringing all the energy that they've accumulated back upstream. Many of them are eaten by predators. And then following spawn, they leave behind large numbers of eggs, and these are all potential nutrient input for the riparian plant communities. The three species are facing a lot of issues to their persistence. Human use of water, we do have a lot of non-native fish. A handful of those fish are really effective predators. And then one of the greatest issues for the two sucker species is non-native hybridization. The problem with hybridization is our native suckers evolved to thrive in this basin. They're our native species, and when you bring in a non-native like the white sucker and allow that hybridization to occur, you're losing that genetic history and that evolutionary history that is part of this ecosystem. So Zach's work is focused on excluding the non-native white suckers, allowing those native suckers to go upstream and spawn. So then when their fry move back down into the Gunnison River, we're getting this big influx of native non-hybridized suckers. Many of the waters these fish spawn in are intermittent streams. All the fish that reproduce in those intermittent streams have to migrate at the beginning of the spawning season. To keep non-natives out of a stream, what you have to do is block access to a stream and then selectively allow only native suckers to pass. A really important spawning tributary is Rubido Creek. In Rubido Creek, near the mouth of the creek, we have installed what's called a resistance board weir. What the fish encounter is essentially a wall of PVC pipe. In the center, we have a chute that leads directly into a large aluminum cage. We'll net them out of the cage and bring them up into the fish working tent. And we want to collect data on a handful of each of the three species so that we can learn more about their population demographics. Flannel mouth sucker, 474, 1465, eggs. We will do a random fin clip for a genetic test, and that just allows us to test our visual identifications against genetics of that fish. Once we do that, we can let that fish go. WXF, white flannel mouth hybrid. This is a hybrid between a flannel mouth and a white sucker. So some of the identifying characteristics of a hybrid, these large scales, especially towards the back of the fish, the caudal peduncle, this long dorsal fin. So if it was a pure white sucker, it'd have a much shorter dorsal fin. And then looking at the mouth, 
The lower lobes are not exceedingly long like they would be on a flannel mouth sucker. The division between the lips is incomplete. So that's how we kind of quickly identify these as a hybrid. All non-natives and hybrids were culling. We've settled on the best practice of disposing of them is just to return them to the Gunnison River to allow all those nutrients to be made reavailable. Brown tail chub, no tag. One of the other goals of this research project is continuing to look at movement of these fish. And to do that, we implant pit tags. We have these pit tags that we've inserted into thousands of these native fish. And we have these pit tag antennas that we've deployed in a number of different tributaries around the state. If you wanna grab those straps, Devin, you want Gwen's end upstream. There. When a pit tagged fish swims by the antenna, that tag number is recorded and then is stored within the antenna's memory. It gives us invaluable information of what time of year they're running, what creeks they're really running into in high numbers, and that allows us to really focus our management goals and actions on those areas where we can have the biggest effect. I think the most important finding is illuminating how important a lot of these small intermittent streams are. The fact that tens of thousands of fish use some of these creeks was completely unknown just several years ago. Each day, once we've collected all of this data on the number of three species that we want per day, so we've met our tag quota and we've gotten demographic information on a subset of fish, then really the focus transitions just to sorting fish. We have a lot of days where we're handling, you know, just a couple hundred fish, which sounds like a lot, but that's a pretty light workload. We'll get days where we're handling anywhere from 800 fish up to 2,000 fish in a single day of movement. It takes a lot of hard work, but it's pretty cool to get to spend that much time out there and just see anywhere from 10,000 individuals to you know maybe over 40 or 50,000 individuals. When you're standing in the creek, if you're downstream of the weir, you'll actually feel fish bumping into your legs and you'll see the wakes as they move through riffles. It's quite awe-inspiring when you really see that number of fish moving on their own to participate in this spawning event. They'll spend the next couple of weeks moving upstream into all those miles of tributary habitat. Once they move up into these tributaries, they'll wait for runoff to start dropping a little bit and temperatures to warm just a hair, and then they'll really get into spawning. It only takes as short as a week up to maybe two weeks for the eggs to hatch. To test how well our tools, like the resistance board weir, work, our best, essentially, endpoint is looking at the larvae that are actually produced within the tributaries. This morning, two groups of us went out simultaneously set uh, drift nets in two different parts of Rubidoux Creek so we can collect eggs and larvae to check the genetics and see if we were successful in excluding the non-native suckers. We then sift through it very carefully and meticulously to look for those eggs and larvae. The larvae, we can prepare them to be preserved and sent in for the genetic sampling. The idea is that we will only see pure genetics in the larvae samples, and that will validate our efforts. Zach's research has been really effective at showing how some of these critical spawning tributaries can really influence whole basins. 
I'm really hopeful that what we have now in terms of their populations is about the worst it's ever going to be. We're never going to get back to where they once were historically, but I really am optimistic that we will halt the decline of these fish and in the long term be able to restore them to a number of places they've been lost from. When you find those places that they're still doing well, you really feel like you're seeing something special. You're seeing that ecosystem doing what it's supposed to do. As someone who professionally has been assigned to work with the three species, but also as an angler, a person who's lived in Colorado my entire life, I find it really rewarding, interesting, and really meaningful to work with these fish. And I just think they're a very cool part of Colorado. Trying to protect these fish is something that becomes very personal for people, I think, in our field. I got into this line of work because I like to fish. If you don't know about these native suckers and chub, they're really easy to malign. But once you get to know them, they really get in your heart, they get in your soul, and it's hard not to care about them. It's definitely inspiring to get out there and do what we can to keep them around.